Hello and welcome once again to Crime Watch UK, where we're hoping you may be able to help with information on any of the cases we're going to be seeing this evening. The police officers here tonight are investigating 16 cases around the UK, from Strathclyde down to Devon. If you see anything at all you think you might recognise or know something about, please do call us. The number, as always, here to the studio is 01811 Last month, almost a thousand viewers saw something on Crime Watch that they recognised. In fact, ten people have since been arrested since that last programme on charges ranging from aggravated burglary to attempted murder. A total of 188 people have now been arrested as a direct result of Crime Watch UK. If you live in Kent and if you've brought any double glazing this year, you might be able to help solve our first case tonight. Since last Christmas, David Short had worked for Danham Windows as their East Kent representative. Ten weeks ago, on the evening of Thursday, the 22nd of September, he was murdered. Despite quite precise information about his movements that night, police have so far drawn only blanks in the search for his killer. Our reconstruction begins in the seaside town of Broadstairs, where David lived. Broadstairs is a popular holiday resort between Ramsgate and Margate on the southeast coast. Perched high above the town is Bleak House, which a century ago inspired Charles Dickens' novel. David Short was 36. He'd lived in Broadstairs for most of his life and had done a variety of jobs. Every day he exercised his dogs around the Ethel Road area, where for the past nine months he'd lived with his common-law wife, Michelle. Two years ago, David was working in a well-known local hotel as a barman. One night, a barmaid recalls there was a visit by two men. Oi, mate, any more trouble from you and I'll bleed and kill you. Have you got that? What was that all about? Nothing. A week later, David reported to work with a swollen face and black eyes. David used to frequent various night spots in Margate and Ramsgate, and police are anxious to talk to anyone who may have seen him in these clubs. They'd also like to speak to somebody called Mags, who David met apparently while working as a barman. In January of this year, David left bartending and started selling double glazing, a job he'd done in the past. Good afternoon. I called the other day, uh, Danham Windows. Oh, Mr. Short. Yes, uh, we're expecting you. Would you like to come in? Thanks very much. How are the kids? Thank you. Thank you. Go through. Thank you. Well, why don't I show you a couple of our brochures? Uh, this includes our latest top of the range bestseller, which uh, features an aluminium frame with a hardwood surround. Over the years, David had worked for several companies. Absolutely. Perhaps he sold double glazing to you. I'll just look at the frame, because that's coming out. Oh, no problem there. And measure up. Get your quote in no time. Business was going very well for David, and he bought a distinctive white Rover car. But if you saw the car recently, you almost certainly noticed the damage to the paintwork. About a month before his death, someone had vandalised his car with paint stripper while it was parked outside his home. Someone obviously had a grudge against him and knew exactly where he lived. Two weeks before David was murdered, a neighbour noticed a short, dark-haired man with a moustache arguing with David on his doorstep. She thought perhaps it had something to do with his business. On Thursday, the 22nd of September, the day David died, he returned home from an afternoon appointment to cook the evening meal. It was about half past five when he sat down to eat with Michelle and his mother, who'd come over for dinner. They had a discussion about the new house David and Michelle were hoping to buy together. How do you think you're going to like living in Dickens Road then? Oh, oh, until right. we've signed we'll on be... that dotted line, I'm not taking anything for granted. Don't worry. Right. I, went, I went to the estate agents today. They've yeah. taken the sign down. Yeah. They have? Oh, well, yeah. that's something. Yeah. We'll be in by Christmas. I'm sure we will be I in by hope Christmas. So. Across the road, a neighbour saw Michelle and David's mother leaving the house on their way to play bingo in Ramsgate. That was about seven o'clock. Ten minutes later, she saw David leaving, smartly dressed and carrying a briefcase. His diary shows an appointment in Deal, and the witness remembers he sat in the car for a few minutes before driving off. Four and three. Forty-three. 
one and two. Number 12. All the sixes, 66. It was a quarter to nine when David returned home. There was a yellow Vauxhall Chevette parked across the road. It had broken down and the owner had gone off for help. At a quarter past nine, just around the corner from David's home, a witness on St. Peter's Park Road saw a motorcyclist preparing to ride off. Police would like him to come forward. At about 20 past nine, the owner of the broken down Chevette came back with his brother. They've told police that in the 20 minutes or so it took them to tow the car away, they don't remember seeing the white rover. So had David gone out again? And if so, where? At about the same time, a quarter of a mile away, another witness saw two men shouting in a car. The woman and child walking nearby may remember seeing the orange or red-coloured old-type saloon car. It stopped just around the corner, outside the Albion public house. At a quarter to ten, David's mother and Michelle left the bingo hall in Ramsgate. In the 15 minutes it took them to get home, David was murdered. His body was lying on the pathway by two broken milk bottles. At about the same time, a man was seen running down this nearby alleyway. When the police and ambulance arrived, it was discovered that David had been sprayed in the face with CS gas and hit on the head twice with a heavy object. Delta Alpha 3-0, In charge of this case is Detective Chief Inspector David Birchill. Mr Birchill, what sort of man was David Short? Well, to be frank, he wasn't very popular. Um, he was a person who had uh, had many threats made to him. Uh, two people, some two years prior to him being murdered, threatened him in the Castle Keep Hotel where he worked, and shortly after that he was beaten up. A month before he died, someone poured paint stripper over his car, uh, causing considerable damage, and we still don't know who did that. And the person who called on him ten days beforehand, who was on his doorstep, who we still haven't traced, was arguing with him. We are interested in uh, the two people at the Castle Keep and that man. So it sounds as though there could be many possible motives for his death. There are. We've investigated many things, but we're still not clear about what the actual motive is. His social life seems to have been reasonably colourful. Yes, indeed it was. He was a person who enjoyed himself and went around the nightclubs in Margate and Ramsgate. And you wanted to find this person called Mags. Any clues on that? We haven't. We know that he was friendly with a person called Mags. We've put appeals out locally, but we've had no response. Anyone by the name of Mags who was associated with David Short, we'd like to hear from. Now, as I said in the film, CS gas was sprayed in David's face. Where could that have come from? Because it's illegal to sell it in this country. It is indeed. Um, there are two canisters here. Um, they are obtainable in France. And we'd like to hear from anyone who knows of anyone who had possession of CS gas in that type of canister, particularly people from Kent. We'd also like to hear from a man, an anonymous caller, who called the incident room shortly after the murder. He told us that CS gas had been obtained in Dover to do a job in Margate. That man promised to come back to us. He hasn't, and we'd like to hear from him. Right, please do call us. And uh, finally, could you recap then on the several people who were seen near David's house on the night that he died? Yes, as the appeal shows, we're looking particularly for three lots of people. There was a man on a motorcycle at 9.15 seen near to his house. We know that there were two men in a car who were arguing about a quarter of a mile away from his house and a man was seen running away from the scene of the crime round about the time the ambulance arrived. He was in St Peter's Park Road broadstairs. So these people need to come forward if only to be eliminated from your inquiries? Yes, and we can assure we'll treat them with discretion if in fact they do come forward. Right. They can save police a lot of time, wasted time if you can come forward and be eliminated from the inquiries and maybe you saw something significant. Just to remind you, it was Thursday, September the 22nd. If you can help Mr Birchall and any of his team with any information at all, do please ring us. The number here to the studio is 01811 or you can ring the incident room direct and that number is 0843 225566. That's 0843, the code for Margate, 225566. Let me tell you more about what happened after last month's programme. The biggest activity that night was prompted by calls about the Preston Bank Raid. The manager of the NatWest bank there had been kidnapped and his wife and daughter were taken hostage. 
Then the entire bank staff was held at gunpoint and locked in the vaults while the gang made off with over half a million pounds. As a result of Crime Watch, the police are now following a new line of inquiry. But they'd like to know in particular more about a red Ford Escort van. Registration number B311HSC. It was stolen on the 4th of August and then abandoned after the robbery. They'd very much like to know if you'd seen where it had been kept in the six weeks in between. On the murder of Michael Williams in North London, there were 120 calls to the studio and to the incident room. No positive results so far, but police are anxious for three of those people to ring back. There was a man calling himself Paul, who said he recognised the artist's impression of a man seen in Highgate Wood. Somebody else rang to say that they had found Michael's access card and had used it without realising its significance. But perhaps the most important call of all came from a security guard who said he had seen Michael leaving East Finchley tube station with another man on the night he died. So police would like all those three people please to ring again. If you're watching, call please either to the studio here or to the incident room. And that number is 01803 3311. 01803 3311. Now to photo call. People caught on camera whom police would like to interview. Maybe there's someone in these videos and photographs that you know. To take us through them, here's David Hatcher. First, on the 18th of August, this man held up and robbed a London branch of the Abbey National Building Society. He escaped with over £2,000. He has short ginger hair, is of medium build and 5 foot 10 inches tall. Then, in September, this man began a series of raids that are all linked to that Abbey National robbery. The total haul is over £14,000. We have two possible theories about this one. It could be the same man dyeing his hair between raids, or it may be two men who are part of the same team. Look at them again. The dark-haired man is also 5 foot 10 inches tall and was wearing a white shirt and black jacket. If you know who he is or who they are, please ring us. Next, my colleagues in Essex want to speak to this man, Raymond John Amis. He may have information about a series of frauds committed in and around Essex. A total of 38 in two years in which over £8,000 has been netted. At this car sales garage in Grays, Essex, a con man convinced staff that their absent colleague had ordered video equipment. They paid up, but as in the other 37 cases, the goods never appeared. Amos is described as 37 years old, 5 foot 9 inches tall, plump, with dark thinning hair and a scar on the left hand side of his forehead. If you've seen him, call us now. About 4pm on Friday the 30th of September, a man entered the Leeds Permanent Building Society in Duke Street, Glasgow and threatened one of the cashiers with a gun. He got away with almost £7,500. We'd like to speak to this man. He's described as in his early 30s, about 5 foot 8 inches tall, slim, with dark brown collar length hair and brown eyes. He was unshaven and was wearing a navy blue zip-up jacket and a green t-shirt. If you know him, or any of our other photo call faces, please get in touch. The number to call 01811 8055. 01811 8055. Some more news now from last month's Crime Watch. Police asked for information about a robbery at an office in Northampton. The owner of the firm surprised an intruder and was att attacked with an axe. His arm was badly injured. As a result of a call to the programme, a 14-year-old boy was arrested in Milton Keynes the following day. He's been charged with aggravated burglary and he'll be appearing in juvenile court early in the new year. We showed pictures from a security camera in a plant hire shop of two men who obtained thousands of pounds worth of equipment using a stolen driving licence. Several viewers thought they recognised the pair and as a direct result, two men have been arrested and charged with obtaining property by deception. Photocall, not surprisingly, often yields results, and last month we showed the picture of Leslie Baptiste, whom police wanted on warrant for offences involving a fraud. A few days after our programme, he walked into a City of London police station with his lawyer and gave himself up. He's now serving a three-year prison sentence for fraud. Well, now we go to Liverpool. Detectives have asked us to help them find a killer who appears to be deranged. In fact, some newspapers have likened it to a Jack the Ripper crime. The facts are that someone, or conceivably several people, killed a prostitute and then mutilated her body. The victim, Linda Donaldson, was found 18 miles away at Winnick Lane, near Lee. Helen Phelps takes up the story.
About a mile from Liverpool city centre is Canning Street. It's a small part of the Toxteth area and it's the city's main red light district. Every night about 20 women are out looking for clients who circulate the area in cars. Many of the women here are on the streets for one reason, heroin. They're drug addicts and have turned to prostitution as a means of funding their needs. Linda Donaldson was one of them. She was well liked. A number of the other women and one of her regular clients have spoken to us about her. Her mother was only 15 when she had Linda. Her father was from another country and uh, Linda never saw him. Linda was brought up by her grandmother. What was she like? Very friendly and great personality. I found her quite a lovable person and loving in return. I was uh, a client at first, obviously, but uh, I really do miss her. I liked her. Everyone liked her. All the girls got on with her. If there ever was a punter that was really bad or evil, you know, or he wanted something that kinky, she'd tell you, she'd let you know about something. She just cared. She cared. She was that sort of person. Linda was careful in a number of ways. She regularly visited this clinic, which was set up to prevent the spread of AIDS by distributing free needles and condoms. And she took clients home by a back alley, back Canning Street, so as not to offend neighbours. I want somebody who walks the streets to respond. Linda was invited to appear on the Kilroy programme a year ago and talked about this very issue. The police in Liverpool wanted us to walk on a deserted street in front of the cathedral and then they thought about it and others a bit more and they put us back into the residential area. Do you get problems well, with I residents in Liverpool? Well, I certainly don't walk past when someone's got kids around me. I wouldn't dream of chatting up a man right in front of kids. Not many girls will. From 7 o'clock on the night of Monday the 17th of October, Linda was at her regular spot here on the corner of Canning Street, where she lived, and Catherine Street. She was distinctive because she always wore black. Sometime before 10 o'clock, she visited the shop in Windsor Street to buy some groceries. It was part of a normal routine. After shopping, she returned to her flat to feed her pets. She walked everywhere quickly. Come on, love. Come on. Linda Come on, loved love. animals. She had a dog and three cats, strays which she and her flatmate had rescued from the streets. Where's my kiss then, eh? Hey? Yeah. In Belgium, the trial of the British fans involved in the Heysel disaster opens in confusion. Tonight, many of them are on their way back home to Liverpool. By 11 o'clock, Linda was back at her usual corner. She was spotted by two policemen. It was a quiet night, but other women say Linda met a number of clients. What's your name, love? It's Tracy. Tracy was her working name. It's vital that anyone who saw or met her that night comes forward. About 11.30, another prostitute was approached by a man whose behaviour made her uneasy. Uh, you doing business? Yeah. Do you know anywhere dark? Forget it. No, come on. No, come on, leave off, OK? Oh, come on. Look, I'm telling you, bug off or I'll get the police. She was worried by the clanking in the bag, and so far police have been unable to trace him. She's compiled this video fit of him. He's described as 5 foot 11 inches tall, in his late 20s, and was wearing a white polar neck sweater. About two hours later, the same prostitute met Linda. Hiya, Linda, how's it going? It's a bit quiet. Yeah, it is. I've just had one of those weirdos tonight. You're joking. <laughs> Told him to get on his bike. <laughs> I'm going to call it a day now, OK? Right. See you around. Yeah, Take okay. care. Yeah. Bye. Taxi. As she got in, she noticed Linda moving towards a dark car which was pulling into Back Canning Street. Who was in the car? No one else saw her alive after this. Just over four hours later, 18 miles away, a maroon Ford Granada Mark II was spotted parked in Winnick Lane near Lee. People in the car may have seen something, and police urgently need to speak to them. 
Then at lunchtime, this elderly couple pulled off the M6 at Junction 22. Winnick Lane links the motorway with the A580 East Lancashire Road. They pulled in at the same place where the maroon car had been seen earlier. We were coming from home and we were travelling up to our daughters in the Pennines. And usually about here I get stiff, I want to usually get out and stretch my legs. And I said to Dorothy, uh, is that a body down there? With that I went down to look to make certain. Came back to uh, Dorothy and said, "The um, it is a body, kid. The body was naked. Linda had been stabbed to death and mutilated. Mr Leaf stayed there while his wife went to fetch the police. Detective Chief Superintendent Ken Clark is in charge of the case. We haven't been able to find a motive for the killing. It appears she was simply picked up, murdered, the body mutilated and then dumped in this field where you see the men searching. So where was she killed? This again is a puzzle we haven't been able to satisfy ourselves about. It's quite obviously that the murder had plenty of room in order to carry out the killing and the mutilation. So there's somewhere between Liverpool and Winnick Lane that he has carried out the murder in plenty of light and taken his time over it. Despite appeals to the public, there's been no sign of a clothing or a handbag anywhere. And this is something that we want to find out if anybody saw anybody acting suspiciously, such as dumping clothing or burning clothing, would they please come forward? And I appeal to anyone of the public who may have anything whatsoever, no matter how small or insignificant, it may be the vital clue that we require. If you have any information, then call us now on 01 811 8055. Or you can ring the incident room direct on Liverpool 708 7277. That's 051, the code for Liverpool, 708 7277. We already appear to be getting a lot of important information tonight. Incidentally, in the search for Raymond Amos, two callers have called to say that uh, they've had dealings with him only in the past week. And we're getting other calls on that subject while we're on the air right now. Now for some more news from uh, previous programmes. We had a particularly good response this month. In our September programme, Kent Police appealed on incident desk for help in tracing a pair of armed robbers who attacked a post office van near Gravesend. As a result of that appeal, one man has been arrested and charged with robbery. Police now think they know the name of a second man they're looking for to help with their inquiries. And also in our September programme, police from the City of London appealed for help in a fraud case involving Citibank. Following that programme, two men and two women have been arrested and charged with conspiracy to defraud. And in October, we showed a photograph of a man wanted in connection with two violent attacks in Brighton. As a direct result of the programme, a man has now been charged with two offences of attempted murder. Just over a year ago, we reconstructed part of a series of car thefts in which owners were duped into giving their car keys to a stranger. If you just leave me the car key, oh. I won't need the house keys. Oh. Just the car key. OK. More than one Crime Watch viewer recognised clues from that reconstruction. As a result, a man was convicted last month of conspiracy to steal 14 vehicles and was sentenced to three years in jail. The police are still looking for his accomplice, but believe they know his name. Well, now to Incident Desk, where this month Surrey police are appealing for your help to find a 15-year-old boy who has disappeared from his home in Cheam. Merseyside police need information on the rape of a young woman by a man with a distinctive tattoo on his right arm. And the Metropolitan Police are looking for a stolen collection of designer clothes. Over now to Superintendent David Hatcher again. First, that attack in Merseyside on the 21st of April. A young woman went jogging in the sand dunes here at Formbury. She was attacked, viciously beaten and raped. Despite the ordeal, the woman managed to give an excellent description of the man. He's white, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 inches tall, in his early 20s, has small hazel eyes and crooked rotten teeth. On his right forearm, he had a tattoo like this, Everton, with FC below it. Now, that's unusual, as the normal Everton tattoo is simply EFC. The man also had a gold and black onyx ring like this on his right hand. He was wearing a grey padded jacket and a white T-shirt with blue diagonal stripes on it, blue jeans and trainers. Here's what he might look like with our video fit added to the artist's drawing. 
Six months later, on the 27th of October, a second woman was assaulted in Waterloo in Merseyside. She struggled and managed to get away. From her description, we think her attacker might be the same as the Formby rapist. We'd like to hear from you if you know anything about either of these attacks. Now, on Crime Watch, we seldom ask for your help with missing people because it may be that no crime has been committed. But on this occasion, my colleagues in Surrey are convinced that the boy they're looking for did not leave home of his own accord. 15-year-old Lee Boxall disappeared on Saturday the 10th of September. He was last seen at 1pm that afternoon in Sutton High Street. Lee is an avid football fan and supported Sutton United, but they were playing away in Lancashire, so he might have gone to another match. He could have gone to Selhurst Park to watch Charlton against Millwall, or to Plough Lane to see Wimbledon play West Ham. He might even have watched local non-league team Carshalton Athletic playing at their ground in Colston Avenue. Lee is slim, about five foot six inches tall and quietly spoken. He was wearing a Flintstones t-shirt like this one and faded black jeans. It's now almost three months since he went missing. If you've seen him or know anything about his disappearance, please get in touch. There is a reward for information as to his whereabouts. Merseyside Police need your help to find the killer of a 23-year-old man from Walton. And on Tuesday the 15th of November, James Gibson was murdered on Alderville Road. He was just yards from his home when he was approached by a gunman and shot at point-blank range. This man was seen getting into a black car after the shooting. He's in his late 20s, about 5 foot 10 inches tall and of muscular build. And the following day, a black MG Maestro, registration number B809GUP, was found abandoned two miles from where James Gibson died. We now know that the car was stolen from Chester five days before, but where was it kept in between? If you recognise the man in the artist's impression, or know anything about that black car, ring us. Next, British Transport Police in London need your help in solving a shocking crime that took place on London's underground system. On Sunday the 23rd of October, just before 4pm, a woman got on the Central Line tube at Ealing Broadway. When the train reached East Acton, two men who may have got on earlier sat beside her. It was unusual because the train was fairly empty. When she attempted to get off at Shepherd's Bush, the men threatened to kill her and forced her to stay on the train. This is a video fit of the man who sat opposite her. He's described as about 25 years old, just under six feet tall, well built, with a deformed upper lip on the left hand side. His accomplice was younger and thinner. Her ordeal continued for 21 stations through the centre of London and the train eventually reached Gants Hill at about a quarter to five. The men forced her off the train and then raped her in the station toilets. We know that several people got on and off that carriage, so if you saw this man or have any information, call us now. It's not often you find me amongst such finery, but on the night of the 1st of October, an entire collection of designer clothes was stolen from this building in Hardwich Street, Southwark, London. The designer, Antonia Powell, has spent months preparing her summer 1989 collection for its official unveiling at the London Designers Show at Olympia. She managed to make copies of part of her collection just in time for the show, which was held ten days later. And these are some of them. The collection consisted of hand-printed silk and linen ladies' clothes, skirts, tops and trousers. All the garments had Antonia Powell's distinctive label sewn inside. The burglary cost Antonia thousands of pounds in lost orders. And sadly, this type of theft is not an isolated case, particularly from designers just before a fashion show. So if you've any information about it, or if you've noticed any of these turning up on market stalls, please ring us now. And just to remind you of the number again here in the studio, it's 01811 Over the past 10 years, banks have tightened up their security measures against armed robberies. As a result, though, raiders have turned to hold-ups in the street, going for the vulnerable moments when cash has to be taken into or out of buildings. These attacks have in part transferred the risk from bank staff to security guards, but also to passers-by. Our next appeal is about one such raid which took place in Greys in Essex where dozens of people were in the line of fire. 
The only actors in the film that follows are those who play the robbers. The witnesses all reenact the parts they played themselves. The reconstruction begins a week before the raid in a quiet road in Greys called Parkside. I looked out of the window and saw a young man get out of the car. I just thought, I wonder what he's doing. And so I went to the door, opened the door and went out as he was walking down the road. He turned round and looked at me and I looked back at him and then came in. I was going to shout, what are you doing parking there? But I thought, oh, it mustn't be that noisy. In this road, it's very narrow, and cars just don't park outside my house unless they're visiting. One week later, on the eve of the robbery, three vehicles were stolen in different parts of London. This 750cc Honda was taken from Lee Street, Hackney. This 750cc Suzuki was outside a motor parts shop in Godston Road, Kenley, near Croydon. And this metallic grey Sierra was stolen from Perry Rise in Sydenham. Next morning, those two bikes were seen. No one could have known it, but the robbers were practicing their getaway. In this alley by the state cinema, they were seen talking to a man who was carrying a sports bag. This taxi driver saw them moments later two bikes pulled out from the alleyway and uh, the only thing that struck me really was that they seemed very professional. It reminded me of courier drivers. Been holed up at Lloyd's Bank. This witness told the taxi driver who'd seen the motorcycles about half an hour earlier, and he got another driver to radio his base for help. This motorist, meanwhile, was looking for a parking space, but changed his mind. What's going on here then? Is it an armed robbery? Has anybody called the police yet? I don't know. They left behind £25,000. Did you see them weaving past traffic on Orsett Road? You might have noticed that the pillion passengers weren't wearing helmets. On Whitehall Road, a young man with bleached blonde hair had been minding the getaway vehicle.
The blue hatchback has not been traced, but the Sierra was abandoned outside the bungalow in Parkside Road, where a blue hatchback had been seen a week before. Do you know where they went from here? Mr. Whitehill, there's a very big reward out on this, isn't there? Yes, there is a £30,000 reward. And the interesting thing is it's not out on recovery of the money, though an enormous amount was stolen, over a quarter of a million pounds. It's for the arrest and conviction of the men. Now, why is that? This robbery took place in broad daylight in a busy street in a busy town. With many members of the public there, and there was a great danger to the public, and I think this £30,000 reward is an inducement for people to give them information to catch these robbers. OK, clearly there are members of the underworld who might have heard rumours on this. There's a very big reward. Tell us about the good description we've got of one of the robbers. The gunman was a white man. He was 5 foot 8, 5 foot 10 tall. He was a muscular, stocky build, wearing a green combat jacket. Right, what we're watching here is what's called an e-fit. There's an electronic version of a, of a photo fit. Now, there was a description of two others, but not quite so good. Yeah, the second man, the black man, in the actual robbery itself, was five foot ten to six foot tall. Again, muscular build. He had a, a flat-topped style haircut, uh, razor cut at the sides, and was wearing a blue, blue wind cheetah. Then, of course, there was the young man who was apparently guarding the, the Blue Sierra. Yes, as we saw in the film, um, he had bleached uh, hair, very neatly cut, um, and witnesses describe him as boyish, almost feminine looking. Now, it's his car that hasn't been traced. The, the Sierra, of course, was abandoned. That's right. And I'd like to emphasise that the hatchback, although it's portrayed in the reconstruction as a Fiesta, it may have been an Astra or a similar car. We just don't know. OK. It's quite significant how those cars that were... And, uh, how the car and the two bikes that were stowed for the raid came from various parts of London. There yes. might be a pattern in that. It may well be, and there may well be that someone knows of a connection between Kenley, Hackney, Sydenham and the Greys area. Kenley is in the Croydon area, of course, and why would somebody have travelled all the way down to Croydon from East 8 or all the way up to East 8 from Croydon? Why that spread of, of thefts? The pattern might be uh, helped to be solved by, by these helmets. Now, these are among the helmets that, that were ditched. This one's very distinctive, isn't it? Someone's going to recognise this one. Yes, I'm sure someone must recognise this helmet. Just below the face visor, there are six holes drilled as extra air holes. Um, and I'm sure that someone... Four on one side, two on the other. That's correct. And I'm sure that someone must recognise this helmet. And they'll Either... recognise how difficult it was to drill through because there's an attempt of course. at drilling a drilling They may have been stolen from them or they may have lent it to someone. And this might also have been stolen. This is yes, this is it. a Nolan make. And the significant thing on this side is N33 Air System 1. That was dumped with the other helmet. So if you made the holes in that helmet or if you had this one stolen from you, if you can work out anything to do with uh, the pattern of uh, the theft of the motorbikes or of the car, if you've got any information at all on this case, remember that enormous reward, you can call us here on 01811 or you can ring the incident room direct. That's on 0245 452120. That's 0245, that's the code for Chelmsford, 452120. Well, now some more faces of people police would like to question in connection with crimes all around the country. Here's David Hatcher again. First, we'd like to find this man who's robbed at least seven building societies in northwest London over the last year. He's got away with over £24,000 so far, often in a Tesco carrier bag. He's armed with a handgun and he's becoming more confident each time he strikes, even threatening other customers. He's in his late 30s or early 40s and has a London accent. If you think you know who he is, please let us know. Devon and Cornwall Police would like to speak to John Cheeseman and Jacqueline Brown. They may have information about some bizarre discoveries made by Dartmoor National Park Rangers in April and May of this year. The cut-up shells of new cars were found dumped on the moors near Oakhampton in Devon. They're from at least 11 top-of-the-range Fords worth over £100,000. Most of them had been stolen from Exeter and had probably had the parts sold off as spares. John Cheeseman, who you may know as John Ransom, and Jacqueline Brown, might now, might now be in London or Kent. If you've seen them recently, we'd like to hear from you. Finally, we need your help to find this man who's threatened customers and staff during seven armed robberies in West London this year. He usually wears a flat cap and bomber jacket 
and always carries the same black holdall and black automatic pistol. He's only left empty-handed on one occasion, and his total haul in London now exceeds £20,000. Just two days ago, he struck again, but this time in Walsall. He's described as being 30 to 35 years old, podgy, and only 5 foot 6 inches tall. If you recognise him, or any of the other faces we've shown tonight, call us now. Number to call is 01811805, 01811805. We've been receiving some promising calls on uh, most of our cases tonight already. A caller to Southgate Police Station has some important information on the murder of David Short. And police believe this is a genuine call. He does seem to know a lot and they'd be very pleased if he'd phone again. There are one or two more questions they'd like to ask. So please do ring back if you can. And uh, a neighbour of David Shorts also recognises the photo fit that we showed of a man arguing with him on the doorstep that time. I don't know whether that means we have a name for him or not, but uh, we'll keep you posted on that. And uh, after our first photo call, when we showed a picture of Raymond Amos, we've had a many, many calls on that, which police believe might lead them to find Raymond Amos. Remember the uh, Glasgow uh, Building Society radio, two callers have independently come up with the same information, and police now believe they're on their way to identification in that case. And on the uh, armed robber in London at the Building Society again, um, they think he's been positively identified by a number of callers, all giving the same name and the same details. And if there's any information you can add on any of tonight's cases, no matter how insignificant or insubstantial it might seem to you, do please give us a call. You can talk to a BBC researcher in the studio here if you prefer. The number again, 01811805. And the numbers of the incident rooms for all these cases are on CFAX on page 186, or you can write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC TV, London, W12 8QT. If you want to see more of what's uh, happening as a result of the calls that are coming in, please join us for Crime Watch Update at 11.45 tonight, or there's a further update on open air at about 11.50 tomorrow morning. We'll be back with our next main programme in just over a month from now. That's after Christmas and the New Year holiday. In fact, it's on the 12th of January. From all of us at Crime Watch, have a marvellous, carefree and crime-free Christmas. And whatever happens, don't have nightmares. Do sleep well. Good night. Good night.